in, in a way, I'm a, a bit of a cheat. I, I guess I'm not really going to be talking about the future, a um, little bit about the past, terrible, and the present. So it's really looking at some of the technology that's available now, and you can take it forward and see where this is going to be in a few years' time. So this is ongoing experiments or experiments that have happened. Now I have to say, I'm not going to do a world tour and say, look at what this person's done, look at what that person's done, otherwise we'd be here all year. I'm, I'm just, this is what I've done, I think it's cool, I hope you do too. It's really that sort of thing. So, just to get us into the spirit of things, some of you know, looking at changing identity, and if we go back, this is going back to the last millennium, it's that far back. Um, this is a younger version of me. Uh, on the, uh, well, uh, my GP, so you, I got this on the National Health. Um, what this was, was a, an RFID, Radio Frequency Identification Device. What it looked like, the thing on the right hand side, not the left hand side, um, and what he did was implant it in my left arm. Uh, it seems since then anybody that has this type of implant, even James Bond, it has to be in their left arm for some reason, I guess it's that. Uh, in the box thinking. Um, it, it's a fairly simple device. That, that was the actual size of it. Nowadays you can get something a lot smaller and some of you here may well have something like that implanted. And there's a couple of my researchers at Reading have the, the very cheap, the smaller one, had it implanted for some time. What it did, what we got it to do, just to show what was possible, um, in my building at, at Reading University, wonderful university, um, we wired it all up so the computer could track me at particular points because of the, the chip, the device. So as I walked towards the laboratory, my, the door opened to the laboratory, going down the corridor, the lights came on, coming in the front door and it said, hello, Professor Warwick, all that sort of thing. So it just with a simple piece of technology that is implanted, um, lots of different things were happening in terms of technology around and, and, and all sorts of wonderful things. Um, at the time, people criticised, well, you, nobody's ever going to want to have anything like this. I'm, I'm sure there are some people in the audience that have a cat or a dog that has such a... Is anybody here? Oh, no. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You, I think quite a few, actually. You can rest assured this was fully tested on humans before your animal can receive it. Um, there are uh, quite a number of people now in the US, the Food and Drug Administration in 2004 okayed the use of this implant for people with diabetes and epilepsy. So there are quite a few people now, it's something like a medical record because it's reprogrammable that you carry around in your body. And of course there are various people, I know David is amongst them, who frequently go to nightclubs in uh, Amsterdam and Barcelona, the Bayer Beach Club, if anybody's been there, you, you have to have an implant, you get it, they send you around the corner and a nurse injects it, and then you get access to particular, I'm not sure about David, he's just been out of the room, so don't tell him what I said. Um, but you, you have to have an implant like this, and then you get access to particular areas in the nightclub, they, and even they charge, you don't have to pay them for drinks, it's charged to your account automatically. Seriously, this is serious. But they use it as a bit like a fashion item, which I, I'd never thought of implants in terms of it's a fashion type. They, they sell the product, the nightclub, based on that. Anyway, enough, enough of that sort of thing. That's the RFID. Let's have a look. This is some of what some of my students are doing for practical projects. Because at Reading, I know there's one or two students here, and those that know that. We have some crazy students there that want to get involved with implants. I thought I'd give you a taste of the things they are doing now. So this is what's going on now. Um, this is the, which you can try at home, I guess. I'm not sure whether I can say that. Um, this is uh, I know three students have got this. This is having a magnet implanted in fingertips, little magnet. Um, this is. Um, you can see the x-rays for one student, a couple of the magnets implanted in fingertips. And uh, this is with Jarish, the first of the students. You see what he's got, a baseball cap is ultrasonic sensors, and then around his fingers is a little coil of wire. Now what happens is, um, the, with the ultrasonic, it's sensory substitution. So essentially the magnets in the fingertips are excited, simply electromagnetism, excited by the current in the coils, and that vibrates the magnets at different frequencies. 
So then you can connect it up to any sensory input you like. Here it's connected up to an ultrasonic sensor. So essentially if something comes closer, then the magnet vibrates more. Or if something goes further away, the mag magnet vibrates less. So the person can feel the distance of objects away. At the moment I have a student this year working on the project with an infrared sensor. So that's not ultrasonic. Again, vibrating the magnets in the same way, but essentially what he can do is to point at somebody and feel how hot they are without touching, or feel whatever, which obviously has military applications. So for a soldier to have a magnet implanted, he can then go into a room, and a dark room, and simply track his finger around the room and can detect if there's anybody in the room. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of potential. Other. So it's, it's sensory substitution. Um, something different, another student at the moment, this is Ashley, um, and what he's doing, this is some work that a guy called um, Baki Rita did a few years ago, it's using the tongue, the tongue is an amazingly sensitive organ, um, or part of the body, and what he's doing, he's got this little array of, uh, well he's essentially he's electrocuting his tongue, really, but with little patterns, so it's another means of communication, uh, he can send signals, he's looking at how quickly he learns to recognise the different patterns, um, how much he stimulates and the, the resolution of course is all the research area, uh, and, but it can be different sensory input as well, so taking sensory input in by the tongue. So it's opening up different sensory paths as input to the brain, which we'll, we'll see a little bit more of in a few minutes. Um, the third area, so this is different bits of the technology, if you didn't like the last one, maybe you'll like this one, opening up different possibilities. Looking now at growing brains, looking at the future of robots, um, not with either human controlling, or not direct human controlling, as you see with um, the, the bomb disposal robots, a tele-operated robot, uh, and not in terms of computer controlling robots, but robots having brains for themselves. Uh, um, little schematic to start us off, um, I'm not sure, can you hear me if I move around? Alright, oh, good. Um, just to show you, this, this is a physical robot, it, it happens for research, it's easier if it's got wheels rather than legs, but we do have robots with legs, whatever. So the body of the robot is a, a physical technological entity. In this case with wheels for stability. It has sonar sensors, ultrasonic sensors, which give a very, very good sense of distance. This is a sense humans here don't really have a good sense of distance. So it's, it's a, an advantage for machines and robots, but it's some advantage potentially we can have. Um, the brain of the robot is not a computer, it's a biological brain, a biological neural network grown on this multi-electrode array. So essentially we have a little dish with electrodes in it and we squidge neurons, brain cells, onto the electrodes and then grow them. The, what this dish looks like, a little bit closer, this is the dish, these things, are, the, the black rings are called potter rings. The brain, the culture grows in there the rings are to stop it dehydrating, we need to keep it with moisture. We uh, take, initially, uh, neurons from rat embryos, we separate them using enzymes and then lay them out in this little dish. We then let them grow for about a week or so and then we can stimulate RAM. Essentially, the, the neur neurons like to connect up. Neurons are into communication. Just a matter of minutes, you can see what look like tentacles uh, got turn out when they start connecting up to be dendrites and axons, just within a few minutes under the microscope. Within a week, you've got a dense mesh, a, a brain, essentially, of, of connections. We can then send signals in to the brain via these electrodes, and then measure responses, considered responses, to the signals we put in on other electrodes. And then we connect it up to a robot body, so we give the brain a body. So the solar signals from the robot stimulate the brain, thinks for a bit, makes a decision, and that turns the wheels of the robot. So what we've got the robot doing, a fairly simple task, typically this brain with the rat neurons has something like 100,000 brain cells. 
So it's not, it's not up to the 100 billion of the human yet, but 100,000 is, is quite cool. You know, it's not a bad number to start with. What we've got now, um, what we're seeing is a little robot with a biological brain. <clears throat> so this is it actually working. All it is supposed to do is move forwards and not bump into the wall. But this is a baby robot, I have to say. This is like two weeks old mentally. So that, it did it fine. That's what we wanted to do. Then it moves out, then it sort of changes its mind, and then it doesn't avoid the wall. There we go. <laughs> but this, this is, it's, we, we can look at how it learns. And what we can see is, under the microscope, we can see the neural pathways changing bit by bit by bit. It, it's in this corral for about an hour a day, and purely by habit, the process of learning by habit, heavy and learning, we can see the brain developing bit by bit by bit. And, and now obviously we want to look at different aspects of how the brain develops. Can we speed it up? Can we understand what memories are in the brain? We don't really know what memories are. If we can understand what memories are from the physical robot body, then perhaps we can start tackling things like Alzheimer's disease, which might help the, the, those who want to live longer and so on, uh, dementia, those sort of things. If we can understand what, what the problem is we're tackling, can we then add stem cells, add more neurons into the brain? If so, where do we add them? How do we add them? We can try with our little model brain. The other thing, we're now working with a group in Canada, you saw the, the culture, the brain was being grown in two dimensions, we're working now to grow it in three dimensions, which increases the number of brain cells to 30 million, approximately. So now that, that's starting again, again it's not the 100 billion yet, but it's 30 million is on the way up, and it is. You know, it's really the technology that's there now. That this is the technology that we have to work with. So if somebody provides us with a, a latticed electrode array that is bigger, then we can put more neurons in it. We can, can increase the size. So size is important in this case. Also important are how much stimulation we give the brain at the moment. It's not really getting an awful lot with the, the ultrasonic sensors. We'd like to give it much more. It's not really doing a lot. So it's the whole of the body development as well as the brain development have looked into. We also have human neurons. And here's where it gets important for humanity plus. If you ever thought you fancied being not in this pretty crap human body, but in an upgraded machine body, then, well, just hold on a minute, there's possibilities here. Um, certainly to take some of your brain cells, if anybody wants to volunteer them, and put them into a robot body. Yeah, the, I mean, that, that, to the technology is there now. This is not talking future. Um, the you know, if somebody wants to give me some of their brain cells now, I'll go take them and put them in a robot body, which opens up all sorts of possibilities. If you want to give me all of your brain cells, then you really are crazy at the time. <laughs> But it's opening up possibilities with the technology that we have now as to doing things like that. So that in the future, when your loved one is about to die, well, take a few of their brain cells and you can have them living in a robot around the home. Maybe there's a commercial opportunity there.